the one mistake I would say is overanalyzing things and not taking action. Um, now it's kind of funny. I'm actually a realtor as well, and I show properties over the weekend, and I find a lot of people just get paralyzed because you know they're hearing interest rates are going up, they're getting outbidded on deals, uh, they feel they're paying too much for a property, and so you know they they don't want to take action. And then a year later, they're kicking themselves because they thought when they were going to buy that house for five fifty, and it's now worth six fifty. They were overpaying for it back then. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Brian Noel is an LP, a KP, and a GP in 15 buildings and over 4,000 units. They have about $470 million in assets under management. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Hey, man, the pleasure is mine. You know, three questions I ask every guest who comes in the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell us where you started, where you are now, and how you got there? Where I started was in London, England. When I was 19, I uh, bought my first house with no money down. Um, and in two years, it doubled in value. And I quickly realized I made more money in equity from the home than I did in my full-time career. So that is what got me started uh, and, and ignited my passion for real estate. And then like many people, uh, probably 20, 25 years ago, I started buying single family investments and I paid those all down and was planning to retire off the income from those single family homes. And then I discovered the benefits of multifamily investing. And so I liquidated all of those in 2018, 2019 and began rolling in that money into uh, multifamily apartments and then discovered the uh, benefits of syndicating and levering up. And so I pretty much do that full time now. That's, uh, you know, for people, if you're 20 years in a single family space, uh, you know, I've, I've seen obviously a lot of uh, a lot of people in this business. Once once they kind of pick their niche and get rich, they don't usually wait 20 years and then shift course at, uh, you know, they, they, they stick with it. I know you, you give there's compelling reasons, you know, to scale and go into other things. But what what were some of the things when you said, hey, you know, I've got this portfolio. I'm going to go do something bigger. Why did you want to transition? Well, there was catalyst that triggered it. One was uh, I had eight rental properties and I had a spreadsheet that I looked at every month and what was eating me alive with the HOA fees. And I decided if I owned the building, then I would be the HOA. I mean, I wouldn't have to keep spending three and a half thousand a month with these HOA companies. Um, so that was one thing. And then the second thing was when I began looking at multifamily housing, um, I came across a commercial broker who shared with me that for every 100,000 that you can generate in either income or expense savings or the combination thereof at a 5.5% cap rate resulted in a million dollars in value. And when he said that, I said, what? Wait, run that by me again? And that was, a, that was my light bulb moment where I figured, okay, I got to look into this more and, and get into this because I had no idea. Wow, that's uh, that's fantastic. And you guys have scaled really, really quickly. I mean, to have almost a half a billion dollars under management in just a few short years. I mean, tell us how you how you did it so fast. Well, you know, honestly, I went to I got a mentor. I went to one of the mentoring programs that's out there and spent a lot of money to sign up for that. And I always say it's some of the best money I ever uh, spent because, you, you know, when you invest in your own education, uh, I feel like you can't go wrong. And I was able to accelerate my uh, entry into multifamily investing and was able to learn in three or four months what would have probably taken me three or four years to learn. Uh, and more importantly, it enabled me to join a group of people that were like-minded people from all over the country, many of which were years ahead of me. And so by teaming up with those folks, I had folks that were able to mentor me and teach me and some of those Folks are partners with me today. Uh, some of the guys in my group where we're con constantly underwriting deals together. Um, so it was a combination of that and then investing passively. And like a lot of people, the first several deals I did was as a passive investor to get the cash flow going and then also start getting my education and getting my hands dirty and then work my way up to being a GP. Gotcha. That's, uh, that's fantastic. How did you select? I mean, it, 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 I'm 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 with you on the mentor. You know, there's mm -hmm. you, you got to pick the mentor that fits you and aligns with your goals. But there's also a lot of mentor programs I feel out there that are just a complete sham and waste of money and time. How did you vet yeah. it out and say this is the right one? 
Well, to be honest, I, I'd like to say I was smart enough that I vetted it out and found the right one, but I didn't. This one was recommended to me by a friend who's a, a real estate attorney, who's somebody I have a lot of respect for his opinion. And I got on a plane and went down to the seminar, um, and then it became very apparent in the first three or four hours that this was somebody uh, that I had to join because I could, you know, he could save me tens of thousands of dollars in mistakes that I'm sure I would have made if I'd have done it on my own. Um, you're right. There's a lot of other mentors out there. Um, I think they've all got their pros and cons. Uh, the particular gentleman that I joined, one of the things I liked is they have several meetings a year and, it, it, you know, there's anywhere from 80 to two or 300 people that come down to those meetings and they're all over the country and they're all like-minded people at various steps, you know, in their, in their journey of multifamily investing. And so that for me was very valuable to be able to come become a part of that ecosystem. Right. Yeah. There's, there's nothing, there's nothing that'll accelerate growth, like being around like-minded people, you know, moving right. towards a common goal as a limited partner. Yeah. You, you said one of the other things you did to kind of grow your active investments was actually go in as a limited partner. Are you mm -hmm. still investing as a limited partner in deals? And I guess the follow-up question to that, if so, how, how are you finding opportunity today? I feel like the market is flush with, you know, a lot of deals that all look the same. So yeah, it, it definitely is. So the short answer is no, I'm trying not to invest any more of my capital as an LP. I want to put it towards being a GP. Mm. The rule is simple, pretty simple for me as an LP. I look to double my money in three to five years as a GP. I look to grow it three to five X. Right. Um, of course, there's a lot more work involved in being a GP, but I don't mind doing that because I'm retired and this is all I do. And for me, it's passion and fun. So I'm happy to do the work. Um, you know, I, I will consider maybe, you know, when as I as some of my deals go full cycle, one just happened in December, and I just rolled that money back up and in as an LP uh, into another deal that that particular gentleman had. Um, and how do I decide on the deal? Well, you know, one piece of advice I have for a lot of investors out there is think about what it is you're trying to accomplish. You know, if you're in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, and you're looking to just grow your net worth, and you don't need that monthly income, then you're better off to go as a class B investor. Um, but there are some folks out there that offer class A offerings where you get more cash on cash return each month, but you give up the back end equity component. Um, and for me, that's important because I'm, I'm relying on that retired income. I don't have a W-2 job. Um, and so I, I, what I've done is put a blended portfolio together where I get a lot of class A income coming in. But then I'm in some deals as a class B investor as well, where my cash and cash return is a lot lower but I ain't going to get a piece of the back end equity when they sell that building. Can you explain that for some of our listeners who maybe aren't familiar with the class A B structure, because it's kind of a, it's a, an iteration of the syndication model that I've seen really take off in the last two or three years. And I actually think it's a brilliant, brilliant way to kind of split up the deals um, at least, or at least, you know, yeah. offer something for both types of investors. Can you, can you define that for our audience sure. just so they understand? Absolutely. More? Yes, so there's, there's something within the investment world known as the capital stack, right? Very top, if you have a preferred investor, which in some deals that we do, we have an equity investor come in, they will insist on only coming in if they're at the top of the preferred equity stack. So that means they get paid first before anybody else. And then you have your class A investors, uh, they get paid next, uh, but they get paid at a much higher rate. So in some of the deals I'm in, one particular guy, he pays 10%, the other one pays 9%. But when they sell that building, you only get your initial capital back. You do not get any split of the equity gain that they got with that building. If you become a class B investor, that means you're further down the equity stack. So you get paid last, you get paid a smaller percentage, usually 6 7% cash on cash versus 9 or 10%. But you do get a piece of that equity split when they sell the building. So in the long run, you'll make more money as a Class B investor. But in the short term, if you're relying on that monthly income to live off, then you're going to get more as a Class A investor. And so that's why I said earlier, I like to balance my portfolio between having some Class A investments where I get higher cash flow every single month. But I'm very cognizant of the fact I'm giving up the rights to any back end equity split. And then some of my other investments, I'm going more for that, you know, 
longer term play where I am going to get a piece of the equity split and, and grow, you know, my hundred thousand to maybe one hundred forty five thousand. Right. Right. Does that does that does that, does that help? Does that kind of make sense? Oh, one hundred percent. Absolutely. You did a great job explaining that. You you hit you hit on something we haven't talked a lot about on this show, which is preferred equity in the you know above the class A investor in your opportunities. Because mm-hmm. what what we've seen happen obviously is if you have a if you have a large single family office or somebody like that that comes in and they put ninety percent or ninety seven and a half percent of the capital, I've even seen as high high as that. Like you said, they're going to be preferred equity. Can you define is mm-hmm. can you define that as well? And then is that one of the funding sources that you guys have relied on to get deals done? Um, in some cases, we have. Uh, we had one deal that we did last year where we had a preferred equity investor that wanted to put in uh, five point nine million. The lender actually came back and would only allow them to put in three point nine million because they didn't want that preferred equity investor to have more than 50% ownership of the building. And, and then, you know, we would lose our voting rights essentially. Um, but they did, they came in and they put in 3.9 million. And of course they want to be, they have a bunch of criteria that you have to meet. One of them of course is they want to be at the capital stack. They want to get paid out before all the other investors. Um, but I'm seeing it gain in popularity because one of the things that you can do and we're certainly looking to do is in two years from now, when the building's appreciated significantly in value, we'll do a cash out refi and take that money and buy that preferred equity investor out. And then at that point, our percentage equity ownership in the building goes up dramatically. Right. Um, So it can be a good thing to do. It's it's a little more difficult to model out. uh, And that's why a lot of people, when they first get into the multifamily business, they tend to steer away from it because it can, you know, it is another layer of complexity. Um, and if people haven't done it before, it can be a little overwhelming and a little nerve wracking. But, you know, once you've done it, it is a way to raise money quickly, especially as the buildings are going up in price. And you see more and more buildings going under contract for 25, 35, 40 million. And the capital raises are going up from 8 million to 12 million to 15 million. Then I'm starting to see more people, you know, go down that preferred equity route or path. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I'm sorry for you guys that they wouldn't let your uh, investor bring the extra couple million bucks. I think it's interesting that you talked about how you, on a cash out refi, because typically, you know, your class A and class B investors, you know, are are happy to get their, or at least your class B. I'm not sure about class A, but class B would be happy to get their capital back and retain their mm-hmm. position in the deal. Right? That's that that's yeah. a fantastic place to be. But you're telling me right. on preferred equity, you write it in the deal such that preferred equity, when a cash out refi event happens, they then lose their position in the deal. They get paid out and they got to move on to something else. For the preferred equity investor, yeah. And, and they're okay with that. I mean, that's negotiated up front that we have the right to give them their money back. Typically, our deals are three to five year deals. But if we can return all their money plus the uh, uh, preferred you know, rate of return, that was committed to, then they have no problem taking that money and moving on. Right. That's really interesting. Yeah. They've essentially achieved their objectives. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's like icing on icing on the cake. I mean, that's, that's beautiful for your, for your uh, class A and B investors. Again, I'm not sure about class A because your class A, if you do a cash out refi, do you also cash out your class A investors? No, not necessarily. I mean, it depends how you put your operating agreement together and how you structure of the deal, right? But you know, another thing to consider, and I'm I'm going in more this direction now with my team as well, because I have one partner who is in four deals that he got into in 2011, and every year they put it to a vote to see if they want to sell the building or hold on to it. Well, they've done since 2011 two cash out refis, so their investors have got their money back twice over, and every year when they put it to a vote. Everybody stays in the deal. You right. can get out if you want, but you're going to get your money back and you're going to give up your rights to any back-end equity. But no one's exercised the option to do that. They all come back and say, nope, let's keep the building. Why? Because the cost basis was like twenty two to 24000 a door, and these deals are in Houston. If you were buying that today, you're probably going to be paying ninety five to 105 a door, right? right? So why would you sell? And a cash-out refi, there's no capital gains on that, right? So. That's what I found a lot of, you know, high net worth, high, very wealthy people do is they buy triple net commercial buildings and every three to five years do a cash out refi, take that money, put it in their pocket. And there's no capital gains on that. At least there isn't today. 
So it's a great strategy. It's a brilliant strategy. Wow. I love that. Thanks for taking the time to break down uh, some of those class structures and how you guys are uh, arranging your capital stack. One of the things we talked about before we started this show was, you know, the bidding war that you guys mm-hmm. are in. And, you know, I'm not sure what what markets you guys are working in, but I don't, I don't think it really matters. If you're in multifamily, you're, you're fighting for deals right now. What are you yeah. guys doing to stay true to your values? And then secondly, how are you still finding opportunity? Well, it's tough, right? I mean, the, the deal flow is definitely there. So we're not having an issue finding the deals. The problem is finding deals with pencil in. Uh, we just lost the deal last week. We made it to best and final. We offered 22.9 million. Uh, when we submitted our final offer, we increased it 23.5. We increased the hard earnest money from 100 to 300 hard day one. Uh, and then I just found out yesterday we lost it. The winning offer was 24.3 million with half a million hard. Uh, that, that I don't know how that works. Maybe they're underwriting to a different set of criteria, but for us, the rates of returns would have come down to where we couldn't held true to our investors. And, and for our investors, we're striving to get 70 to 100% in three to five years. And that would have put us way below that. So, you know, and we're seeing that happen a lot. And so uh, either people are changing their criteria, there's more institutions coming in and, and they're happy with a lower rate of return, maybe five, 6% instead of eight, 9%. Um, or some people are increasing their hold time instead of three to five years, five to seven years. Um, so those are all factors that, you know, we're looking at constantly, um, but it's, it's getting harder and harder for sure. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely intriguing. Yeah. And you can't, I mean, you're, again, you know, I've got a, I've got a family member that trade, you know, it's a, it's a bond trader. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you have institutional capital seeking, you know, they're, they're talking in, in, you know, basis points of right. you know, return. And it's like, wait, you, right. you, when they're throwing tens of millions of dollars at basis points, and you can right. throw tens of million dollars and, and churn five, six percent. I mean, yeah. it, it makes all the sense in the world why why all this capital is fl- you know flying into uh, you know hard assets like this. They're just right. they're seeking yield anywhere they can. Yep. So sure. that's uh, that's really intriguing, Brian. I've certainly enjoyed this conversation today. Thanks for coming on the show and talking to us. You know, yeah. breaking down uh, you know how, your guys' business, how you guys are finding opportunity and, and really just kind of some of the, you know, again, the capital stack and how that works. That's been great. Let's jump here into the final four questions. The first one is this, what is one tool or resource? Think software, think something digital that you find that you can't live without. Well, I'd say it has to be my cell phone because unfortunately I've lost it a few times where I left it in an Uber. And, you know, when you lose your cell phone, you really realize how, how you know, desperate you are and how disconnected you are from everybody and everything. Um, so I'd say my cell phone is the one thing I could never live without. Um, you know, beyond that, I would say email, um, Excel spreadsheets. Um, those are the things that I use every single day. Got it. Fascinating. If you could help our listeners avoid just one mistake in real estate, what would it be and how would you avoid it? The one mistake I would say is overanalyzing things and not taking action. Um now, it's kind of funny. I'm actually a realtor as well, and I show properties over the weekend, and I find a lot of people just get paralyzed because you know they're hearing interest rates are going up, they're getting outbidded on deals, uh, they feel they're paying too much for a property, and so you know they they don't want to take action. And then a year later, they're kicking themselves because they thought when they were going to buy that house for five fifty and it's now worth six fifty, they were overpaying for it back then. Um, so, you know, I listen to people like Grant Cardone and the Brad Sumrocks of the world, and they often say the one mistake they made looking back is they should have bought even more real estate. Um, so I'd say that's the mistake is, is, you know, don't get paralyzed. Don't overanalyze. Don't not take action. Do something. Do something. I love it. When it comes to investing in the world, what's one thing you're doing right now to make the world a better place? Uh, well, I like to try to give back. So, uh, my girlfriend and I have a, a, an orphanage in Mexico where we donated some money and some gifts to, and we went down there and visited it last year. And it's very, very humbling to see these kids that are four to 15 that have no families and, and they're living in this orphanage with hand-me-down clothes and, and they really have nothing. Um, and it's, so it's very gratifying to be able to go there and make some donations and give them some toys and help make their life a little bit better and a little bit easier. Man, that's great. That's great. Certainly need uh, more of that in this world. Brian, if our listeners want to get in touch with you or learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? 
They can either email me at brian, B-R-I-A-N, at ascotequitypartners.com or look at my website, which is ascotequitypartners.com or drop me a text or call me, 720-217-7656. Brian, thank you so much for your time. Do appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Sam. It was a pleasure.